I want to begin uh, with, with two personal anecdotes, which, which had a very significant influence, actually, on, on my life and my intellectual life. One of them was when I was in the Israeli army. Uh, I was serving as a psychologist at the time. I was a very young man. I was 20 years old. And, and I was involved in the selection of officers of candidates for officer training. And the way that this was done, this was in the 1950s, and so a very long time ago, and we had inherited from the British a sort of system for selecting officer candidates, and that involved, uh, the most significant part of it, involved a field test. And in the field test, people would be facing an obstacle in groups of eight uh, with no designated leader. It was called a leaderless group exercise. So there was no designated leader. There were eight people. You asked them, there was a telephone pole and an obstacle. And you asked them to pick up the pole, and their task was to go over the obstacle without the pole touching the ground, without the pole touching the obstacle, and without anybody touching the obstacle. So they had to go clear over that thing. It was quite complicated. The pole was very heavy. Uh, I remember the places, of course, it's Israel, and uh, very sunny and, and hot. And so you had eight very sweaty people trying to get over an obstacle in a leaderless situation. And there were two of us uh, taking notes. And the very striking thing that happens when you are in such a situation is that you get an immediate and complete image of each of the individual's personality. So there were eight of them, numbered one through eight, and, and we took notes. And you can clearly see, you know, there are some leaders, there are strong people, there are really very weak people, there are people who are sort of good followers but not impressive by their leadership. And you have the impression that you are in contact with these people's personality. And and there was really very little doubt, as, as we watched it, that we understood these people. And there was very little doubt in our mind that we were quite capable of predicting in advance how well they would do uh, as officers. And you know, we could imagine them uh, in officer training school. We could imagine them in combat. We could. It was very, very clear that we knew these people very well. Uh, and then. Uh, Every so often, I think every few weeks or so, we would get statistics from officer training school on how well the people that we had passed on to the officer training school were doing in the school. And this was a criterion that, in fact, we were trying to predict. And those things happened, I remember, a Friday afternoon. And at, at the time, Friday was a working day. Then there were the Sabbaths, Saturday. And on Sunday, there was. Um, work began again. And each of those Friday afternoons was a bit of a disaster because it turns out we had no idea of how well those people were going to be in officer training school. Absolutely no idea. The correlation between our predictions and what actually happened was essentially zero. And it was time after time zero. We had no idea. And so the statistics were absolutely clear. But, you know, it's, it was the army, so uh, we knew that what we were doing was completely useless, but on the Sunday morning, there was another group of people, and we would take them to the, uh, to the obstacle course, and we would give them the telephone pole, and they'd be uh, going over the wall, and we saw their personality absolutely clearly. There was no question, although we knew the statistics, that we knew about each of these individuals. We had a clear feeling that we knew how good they would be as officers. It was just, and it was striking to me. I had some psychology. I didn't have much, but I'd, I had my first degree in psychology at the time. And I realized that there was something utterly absurd that was happening to me, because it was happening to me, that I knew the statistics. I knew this was worthless, what we were doing. But I knew that in general. I knew that as a statistical fact that what we were 
uh, what we knew about those people was totally useless, but I had, it didn't apply to any individual case. About the individual cases, I had that immediate sense that I knew their person. And I, th that was actually the first technical term that I ever invented. I called that the illusion of validity. It's an illusion that you have that you can make valid judgments. And like an illusion, you can know the facts. That is, I knew that my sense of validity was false, but that knowledge had absolutely no effect on what I saw. This is exactly like in you know, the famous Mueller liar illusion with the fins on, on both sides. Uh, one line, you know perfectly well that the two lines are equal, but you keep seeing one line as longer than the other. So that's one story. And it, in some sense, it was really the beginning of my career as a student of judgment and decision making. I returned to it much, much later when I started collaborating with Emma Tversky. But that, uh, that image of, uh, of knowing something, knowing the statistics of something, and not applying it to the individual case, that remained with me. And it turns out, I think, to be quite an important and significant uh, indication of how the mind works. Now, I'll tell you another story, which is, uh, that happens much later. <coughs> uh, I was, at that time, at Hebrew University, and Amos Tversky and I uh, had begun our work on judgment, and I had become interested in teaching, in developing a curriculum for teaching judgment and decision-making to high school students. So that was the project. It, we're about to teach them about the mistakes that people make and about the theory of uh, how to make proper predictions. And, um, and we started writing that book for high school students. It was supposed not to have mathematics in it, so it was quite distinctive. And I set up a group. And the group had a number of teachers in it. It had some of my assistants in it. And it also had a couple of education experts. And one of them uh, is the late Simon Fox, uh, who was then the dean of the School of Education in Israel, and a real expert on curriculum development. And uh, we would meet every Friday. Uh, and, and had our, our meeting and our planning meetings. And we'd been working, I think, for about a year. When uh, I, I had an idea uh, on that afternoon to try to carry out an exercise in the group of the kind of exercises that we were teaching, uh, intending to teach other people how to do. And the exercise was let's try to figure out how long it will take us to finish the book. Now, you, you may ask, why hadn't we asked that before? And it's an interesting question why we hadn't asked that before, but we hadn't. And so it was an interesting thing to try to do. And, and I did it correctly. I think it's the only thing I did correctly that day. I, um, I asked everybody to write on a slip of paper, and I did that too, how long before we would have a draft ready to hand out and over to the Ministry of Education. And we all did. And then they all gave me the slips of paper, and uh, we looked at them. And it was we were all really in fairly close agreement about, about how long it should take us to complete the project. And the agreement was between a year and a half and two and a half years. And all of us agreed on that, including Seymour Fox and including me. Uh, and how we got to it. It was fairly clear. We had a sense of our progress and of the rate at which we were going. We were basically extrapolating. We were taking a margin of safety. We were doing what looks like a very reasonable way of doing this. But uh, then I had an idea, because Seymour was, uh, was an expert on curriculum development, and so I. It, it occurred to me to ask Seymour whether he knew other teams which, like our team, were engaged in developing a curriculum where no curriculum had existed before, because there, this was a new subject. It just didn't exist. And, and Seymour said, actually, he knew quite a lot. Uh, and he knew in detail about um, this was a period when things called new mathematics and new biology uh, curricula like that were being developed in many places, and he was aware of it. 
And, and so I asked Seymour uh, whether he knew enough about those teams to locate them in terms of progress at roughly the same point that we were. And he said he could. Uh, and then, of course, there was an obvious question. I said, well, you know, if you, can, if you know where they were when they matched our progress, how long did it take them to complete the book? So, you know, it looked like an obvious question that, uh, that you should ask. And, um, and, you know, in my story, it's a story I've told many times, so uh, it's become a legend even for me. And uh, in my legend, he blushed, but it certainly took him a long time. And then he said something that, that I remember distinctly because it was very striking. He said, you know, they didn't all succeed in writing a book. Now that thought that, you know, that we could fail just didn't occur to us, hadn't occurred to us before. We said, how many, what proportion didn't finish a book? And said, oh, maybe about 40% just never got around to finish their project. So that was not good. And then, of course, the next question was, and how about those who finished the book? How long did it take them to finish the book? And there he took a while, and he said, I cannot think of anyone that took less than seven years. <laughs> and uh, that wasn't very good. Uh, and, and he said, and I can't think of anyone who went on for more than 10 years. So somewhere between seven years and 10 years is where all those cases that finished the book, this is the time it took them. OK, so that was bad news, and we all knew it was bad news. And, and so I asked him, almost in desperation, if we compare ourselves to those other teams in terms of resources and you know, what, we have, what we have at our disposition to succeed in the task, how do we compare to those other teams? And that time, he didn't hesitate at all. And he said, we're below average. Uh, not by much, he said, but we are below average. So now, here is a situation. And, uh, and several interesting things psychologically are happening in the situation. The, the first is that there seem to be two very different ways of looking at the same problem. And we called one of them the inside view, much later, and the other the outside view. And in the inside view, you're inside the problem, and you're trying to figure out how long it will take you to, uh, to complete the task. And in the outside view, you're not dealing with a particular case at all. In the outside view, uh, you can put that here. It's my coat. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should be sorry. Uh, <laughs> And in the outside view, you're not looking at the individual case at all. What you're looking at is a class, a category of similar cases. And you're looking at the statistics of the similar cases. And what's remarkable psychologically about this was, all right, we didn't know about curricula. But what's interesting is what happened in Seymour's mind, because Seymour had said, I think, that you know, it would take us two years. I mean, his judgment was exactly inside the distribution of the group judgment. Now, he had in his head information that pointed very clearly to a different solution, that it would, that would very likely would fail, and that if we succeeded, it would take us at least seven years. But no contact was made between that information that he has in his head and the judgment that he made about how long it would take us. So there was that contrast between those two ways of looking at the problem, uh, the inside view and the outside view, and the outside view being the most statistical view of things. And, uh, really, you can feel that it's uh, qualitatively different as a way of thinking. And it was very clear that all of us were inclined to take the inside view. That is, the inside view was a natural way for us to make a judgment and reach a conclusion about that particular problem. Now, uh, I, can, I can tell you if anybody is curious. Uh, the, it turns out, of course, in a situation like that, that nobody has any idea of why it is going to take seven or eight years. You know, because the plan, it shouldn't take seven or eight years. 
And it turns out also that all these teams that took seven or eight years, different things happened to them. It wasn't one thing that happened. You know, in, in our case, there were administrative difficulties. I got divorced. I left Israel. So I wasn't even part of the project. The project was terminated eight years later, uh, as it happens, which is, of course, an accident, a coincidence that the prediction was so close. Uh, the book was completely useless. It was never used. By the time the, the project was finished, the Ministry of Education had lost interest, and, and that was the end of that particular project, I think. Uh, and, and then there is something that I hope I can return to. For many years, I thought that the interesting psychological case in the story was Seymour Fox, uh, because you know he had had that particular separation between uh, the inside view and the outside view. And, Actually, it took me many years, I'm ashamed to say, to realize that the real idiot in that story was me. Because what we should have done, of course, if we had been rational, we should have quit that day. I mean, none of us was interested in spending seven years with a probability 0.5 of success for a project that really didn't matter all that much. I didn't stop. They didn't stop. It was absolutely the end of rational planning for that book, which is sort of remarkable because the topic of the book was rationality. I mean, we were, we, we were trying to teach people how to think rationally, and there I was. And I, I really can tell you, it took me years before I started being ashamed of myself. I, I did not see how idiotic I had been that day in not stopping. So again, there is that strange dichotomy between knowing something, you know, that in, of course you should quit, and, and it didn't really occur to me to quit. And the difference here, and it's similar to the difference in the officer training course, is that we were a team, and we had high morale, and we were making progress, and every week we were doing something. And the knowledge about the statistics, the knowledge that you know, other teams had, had succeeded differently, that just didn't connect with our experience. And it was our experience and our plans and what we were thinking about and the details and the specific context of the situation that completely dominated both what we predicted about the future and how we acted when we in effect, we're told something very pertinent about the future. We ignored it. I ignored it. Because in fact, if you had asked me what I believed, I would probably have said that I believe the statistics. It's not that I had any reason to ignore the statistics. I didn't consciously ignore the statistics. But in fact, I ignored the statistics. I, we kept going because we had momentum and we were going. And, and the idea of stopping just because of that abstract bit of news seemed somehow absurd. The sensible thing to do, the obvious thing to do, was continue, and this is what we did. Now, there are elements that are common in, in those two stories. The one, one element is knowledge, and, and the knowledge uh, takes statistical forms, and it's, it's about a category. And then there is the, another kind of knowledge, which is about the case at hand. It's about the individual case. And it's immediate, and it's alive, and it's not abstract. It is highly concrete. And, and it is the second that dominates, the second kind of knowledge that dominates action, and that dominates real beliefs, actually, about uh, what is going to happen. In a way, I'm characterizing the contrast that we have in both of these stories in, in the terms of the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, La Pensée de Vitesse, and uh, System 1 and System 2. And I speak of System 1 as the fast system, but it's the intuitive system. It is actually the system that generates, although we're not fully aware of it, but it is mostly the one that generates the fact that it generates those predictions, it generates those uh, decisions, it is the origin of those decisions. Ultimately, consciously, we feel we're doing something else. 
we feel that we are acting reasonably or we, you know, we don't feel I'm being swept away by something that is truly foolish, you feel you're just acting in the way that is sort of suggested by the circumstances, but that's not true. You are acting because of a, an intuition, because of a vague sense of what is appropriate, and that is what system one does, and system two, the slower thinking system, doesn't do all that much in this case. So I'm describing the mind, uh, an ambitious project to describe the mind, but I'm describing the mind as an interaction between two ways that thoughts come to mind. And by thoughts, I mean thoughts very broadly. I mean thoughts include emotions and include uh, tendencies to act and so on. And one is essentially automatic. And so, you know, the obvious example is if I tell you two plus two, then a number comes to your mind and it comes to your mind automatically. You didn't ask for it, you didn't invite it, you didn't intend to do it, it just comes. And the other way of thinking about it, of thinking about things, is you know what might happen to you if I say, oh, I don't know, 17 times 48, and nothing comes to mind for most of you, except that it's a multiplication problem, and they probably either can or cannot do it in your head, but no answer comes to your mind immediately. And if you generate the answer, which most of you are capable of doing, you will be following rules, you will be thinking slowly, your pupil will get larger, your heart rate will increase because you will be putting mental effort and in a way physical effort in generating the solution. And this is slow thinking, it's controlled thinking, it is effortful thinking, and it is the kind of thinking that we most clearly associate with something that I do. It is not something that is happening to me, it is something that I do. And the interaction between those two systems, consciously we feel that we're system two beings, that we have reasons for what we do, that we have arguments for what we do, and that we reason more or less sensibly, not always logically, but in, in, a, in a pretty reasonable way. The picture that I'm drawing is slightly different. In the picture that I'm drawing, uh, system two is actually in control in the sense that you don't say anything that comes to your mind. You know, there are things that come to your mind that you suppress. Uh, you don't yield to every impulse. Most impulses, you know, many impulses we resist or we defer. So system two is in control, in a way. But the one that actually runs the show most of the time is system one. That is, in the, in the picture that I draw, you have that automatic system. It generates suggestions. It generates impressions. It generates feelings. And they tend to guide system two. And system two can overcome it. But most of the time, and I describe system two as very lazy. Most of the time, it just accepts the suggestions that come from system one, and, it, and those suggestions become beliefs, and they become intentions, and they become actions, and uh, they, uh, they become part of who we think and we know we are. So that's, uh, a crude, in a crude way, a distinction between the two systems in terms of how that relates to uh, the, the anecdotes with which I began this talk, the impression that you get when you watch you know, a bunch of sweaty soldiers trying to get over uh, an obstacle with a telephone pole, uh, that impression is really a strong intuitive impression. It's a judgment of strength or weakness or selfishness or whatever, and, and it's overwhelmingly powerful. And it doesn't stop. It is not merely a judgment 
about what you're seeing this minute. It is an impression that you are seeing the individual, you're seeing a personality, you're seeing the whole system. And that is the way system one of the intuitive system works. Now, about the laziness of system two, uh, and why I call it lazy, um, there's now a problem that was invented actually by a postdoc of mine while we were working together. And I don't know if he invented it or found it actually. Uh, but the problem is this. I'll go slowly. Uh, it is a bat. Uh, how do you say that in French? A baton, uh, I would think. And a ball uh, cost together, well, I say it in dollars, not to get confused. They cost together a dollar ten. And the bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? And what is interesting about this is that there is an answer that comes to everybody's mind first. And the word 10 cents, that immediately comes to mind. The next interesting thing is, of course, it's not 10 cents. And it's very, very easy to figure out that it's not 10 cents, because if the ball is 10 cents, then the bat is a dollar and 10 cents, and then together it's a dollar and 20 cents. So, 10 cents is wrong, but 10 cents comes to everybody's mind. And that is called an association. By association, somehow, the 10 cents and the dollar 10 that creates a very powerful uh, impulse to think about 10 cents. Now, the next interesting thing is that this questionnaire, this question has been put to thousands of people by now, including students at Harvard and Princeton and MIT. And uh, I'm not sure if it's been put here, but uh, I don't think the results are very likely to be very different. At Harvard and Princeton and MIT, about 50% get it wrong. They say 10 cents. And that is interesting and a little frightening, because what it means is that these people do not check. Anybody who says 10 cents has had an answer, has had an association. And system two, that comes from system one. Its memory delivers that association, like two plus two equals four, it comes. And you either trust it, and then you write 10 cents, or you check it. And if you check it, you don't write 10 cents, because it's false. So you know about about 50% of people that they don't check. That's very impressive. In some universities, more inferior universities, uh, in the United States, about 90% fail it. So it's, uh, it's quite a powerful test. It's very, very simple. I'll give you another example which uh, leads to a similar point. Um, and that example, in that question, you are asked to evaluate whether a syllogism, a deduction, is valid. So that's what you're asked. Is it, does the consequence follow, the conclusion follow from the premises? And so this is the syllogism. All roses are flowers. Some flowers wilt quickly, that is, they fade quickly. Therefore, and that's the conclusion. Some roses fade quickly. Okay? Now, this is false, but this experiment was done in England, and I think about 80% of students at a good university in the UK say it's true. Now, what's happening? The conclusion is true. The argument is false. Now, these, these are people who have no difficulty whatsoever making the judgment if you do it in terms of X and Y. But when it's about roses and flowers and fading quickly, they get it wrong. And what happens when they get it wrong is that there is a powerful association. You're trying to see if the argument is valid. But in your head, there is something that shouts, it's true, it's true. And it's very difficult to distinguish its being true from its being valid. So the two responses are associated 
to one another and the temptation to give one when you're asked the other. And one is easy. It came first. You know it's true. And the other is harder and it demands work. And if system two is a little lazy, then system one is going to convince system two it's okay. Uh, the argument must be valid because the conclusion is true. So that's the interaction between those two systems. One, system one, as I describe it, is mostly associative memory. It's what is associated with what. And system two is, for psychologists, executive control. It has to do with self-control. It has to do with the exertion of mental effort. And one of them is automatic, and the other is effortful. 